Hello all you star citizens out there, this is Shows with the Aerial Heights Gaming Community. Today bringing you part 2 of my ship and company who makes ships video. I could have worded that better, but I decided not to because I've already had to restart this thing multiple times. But we're going to ignore all that and we're going to have a nice, calm discussion regarding aliens. Yes, there are three current vessels that have been at some point available to the star citizen community uh, for purchase or through little special things that CIG done has done at their headquarters in Austin that we've managed to get our hands on. There are three vessels, one for each of the three alien races that have a lot of lore behind them at the moment. So I wanted to talk about those three alien vessels. The problem is, is that the alien vessels, there's only one of each. So there's really nothing much to compare because there are no other vessels available and all the other ones are concept art or, you know, may never get into the game and they could come out with vessels at any point. And there's no clear database on the company, whereas Misk or Drake or Aegis all have dedicated pages. You kind of have to go through the backlog of posts on the main RSA website through Lore Builder and whatnot to kind of find bits and pieces of the alien stories and whatnot. So I've gone through and done that, and to kind of extend this video out a bit instead of just showing you three alien vessels with no backstory, I've decided to do a brief overview of each alien species, do a brief overview of some of the important systems that I could find, I may have missed some, keep that in mind, that they control and those little unique things about the systems, and then I'll tell you about the one ship that they have. And we're going to be starting off with the Xeon, or the Xeon. I don't know how it's pronounced. I know that that's supposed to, like the X is supposed to pronounce like a Z. Uh, I just call them Xeon because Gundam was cool. Gundam was awesome. If you don't think Gundam was awesome, stop watching this video right now. I'm sorry, I don't want to stop. Keep watching this video, man. I love you guys so much. Anyway, the Xeon, and I know I'm butchering it, I'm not saying it right, I don't care. The Xeon are a reptilian-like race. Uh, they live a very long time, and they are a monarchy. They have an emperor, and the title is passed down through the bloodlines. They are also very militaristic. Every Xeon citizen must spend 15 years of their life serving in the military. This puts, the UEE estimates their armed forces right now at 16 million. That number could be way off, because they don't know about more of the deeper parts of Xeon space. However, this does mean that every Xeon across the entire empire is a military trained person and is a reservist. So literally, if they have the, the, the money and the supplies, the entire race could be called in to fight in the, in the military. Holy crap, that is really weird to think about the fact that when you're walking on a Xeon planet, um, everyone around you is a trained soldier and a trained killer, and they could mess you up really bad. Uh, to put the, to really go ahead and just say something, if you're a smuggler or you're a do, or if you're a no good do or whatever, be really careful in Xeon space because they take their laws very seriously. I would think so, seeing as how they're so militaristic. Now, Interesting enough, besides the fact that they're so militaristic, the Xeon have a long history of not starting the wars that they get into. This being said, we are going on UEE files that have been supplied to us by the Xeon, so maybe there's been a little color coding in the history going on. I don't know. However, the Xeon do have a long history of civil wars for the throne. So basically you got an entire race of soldiers and a lot of Game of Thrones goes on. Uh, in recent years, the military has shifted from open war to more covert, covert ops, such as espionage, assassination. Uh, it is important to note with the UEE, the humanity, that there was a Cold War at one point. Um, during a dark period, the UEE was less of a collaboration of governments working together and more of an imperial empire. Uh, the guy at the top, the prime citizen, kind of named himself emperor and used blackmail and espionage and cold-blooded killings to keep himself in power. Humanity was oppressed. I mean, it was basically a communist nightmare and the entire humanity, human empire basically became subjugated to this corrupt government that worked them, you know, 15, 18 hour days and colonists were subject to very little rights. And my phone is ringing. Sorry about that. I had a phone call, very important phone call I had to take. But anyway, the government was very corrupt and to kind of keep people in line, they used, they did a smear campaign and painted the Xeon as this 
horrific race of killers that would come in the night and steal the children, and that they needed the protection and the umbrella of the UEE military, and that all that we do is to keep you safe. So they kind of used mass fear and hysteria to keep the people in check underneath the, the boot of this iron government. Um, that didn't pan out. The government was, uh, the corrupt government is gone. And, but a little bit of that fear and xenophobia still lives on to this day on both sides of the line. Now, as far as systems go, the, there is the Tal system. The Xi'an, the Xi'an, love large-scale industry. They love huge complexes pumping out and being productive, and they love mass you know, shipbuilding sites, and they love big industry. So there is a system, the Tau system has four planets, and all of them are just covered in industry. These in, these factories require a lot of imports to keep going, and they export a lot of goods. So if you're a long-haul mercantile pilot, and you want a, a good, clean run, and maybe you're tired of smuggling or the risks that come with it, you can take your big freighter and go here, and you can, you can get a lot of goods legally in, and not only that, but you can resupply on the same planet with a lot of goods coming out, and go back into UEE space and sell along the way. It is also to note an important little feature is that entire buildings on these planets are color-coded to on by what they do. The Xeon love um, structured organizations like this. So the so most of the buildings on each of the four planets, most of the buildings are all painted different colors, like yellows and greens and purples. So it's kind of like a rainbow landscape. That noting, when you go to one of the four planets, there'll be a lot of one color and a few of the other ones to dictate administration buildings and whatnot. There is the Eulis system. It is a nature preserve, believe it or not. And the, and the Xeon had four nature preserves. Two are top secret. And all three of them are backups. The two are top secret so that people know no one messes with the backups. The Xeon are really, really protective of these animals. It's a lot of animals that have gone extinct on some places. Flora and fauna that have gone as extinct on some places. And basically these are used as seed worlds where if they want to colonize a world with uh, plants or something and something goes wrong, the Xeon have somewhere to go. And they have animals. It, it's a really cool idea. The, it requires a lot of imports, again, food, water, basic necessities to keep it going. Smuggling animals is extremely dangerous. While a black market rich dude will probably pay a lot for some foreign pet, you are trying to smuggle off of a militaristic world. Be very, very careful. Also, for those of you who are interested, some pop culture icon named Zandy uh, makes their music videos here. So, there's that. Maybe you can... Maybe it's possible that when this comes out, we'll be able to go across Ulyss in kind of like a safari off-road vehicle and stumble across a music video being made by a bunch of aliens. That'd be a cool little Easter egg, I would think. There's the Hadrian system. This is a Xeon and UEE uh, joint ownership system. It is also known as No Man's Land. This is where the bulk of the Navy of the Xeon and the UEE were stationed because this this system was a good jumping point for the Xeon into, into humanity space and for humanity into Xeon space. So basically, this was the crux world. This is the world where most of the navies would jump in and then they would jump into enemy territory from here. So during the Cold War, there was always a lot of ships on both sides here kind of across this imaginary line. And to this day, there still are. There's a lot of Navy UEE ships here, and there's a lot of Xeon ships here. This is kind of the legitimate border crossing from humanity into Xeon space. And it is said that you can ex be expected to be scanned at least three times. You can be expected to scan by the Xeon or the UEE, whichever way you come. Your cargo hold will most likely be scanned. There is a joint customs ownership checkpoint in the center, which will be scanned. And then the other Navy will scan you on your way out. The, the flight lanes are very narrow. There's not You can't go out a lot of places in here. There is a very strict area. You can fly here, leave, and you risk being arrested or fired upon by military vessels. Smugglers, beware, you may want to take a back alley place to get through this system. There is the Riley system, only syst uh, and it's the only system of the Xeon with dedicated artwork on the website. All of the other ones were kind of like thumbnail or just planets from far, far away. This was used as a major staging post. This was kind of like the backup to the Hadrian system. This is a major military staging post for the Navy. However, the world is 
kind of changing because the Navy is pulling out of the Ryla system. They are moving on to other systems, kind of diversifying because the UEE isn't that big of a threat anymore, and they've got Vanduul on one side. So they're kind of spreading their Navy out. So the biggest customer was the entire economy of the planet was based around a lot of soldiers being here, and now all of these soldiers are leaving, which means the planet is going through an identity crisis. The What will the planet become? Will the planet fall into ruin and become lawless? Will it become like a, will it find a new calling? Will it become a major trade world? Will it become maybe a tourist world? How, I don't know how much control we as the Star Citizen community will have on the fate of the Ryla system or any control over it, but the, the idea that maybe at some point the Ryla system, its future could be determined by the amount of commerce and the amount of stuff that the community does to it. Maybe we bring a lot of foreign animals there and turn it into a more of a tourist spot. Maybe a lot of player-based companies invest there and kind of boost the economy up. It'd be cool to either have this system collapse or or find new calling based on what we as the players do. However, I cannot tell you how much control, if any, we'll have on it. For all you smugglers out there who do want to risk the Xeon military's uh, militaristic ways and scanning equipment, there is a large black market weapon surplus on this planet because the military is leaving. Again, a lot of things go missing. And then, as you can see from this concept art, the Xeon like their military vessels vertical. That brings us to the one ship that the Xeon have, the Xeon Scout. Uh, there's no concept art for this, although people are kind of assuming that it's this little vertical ship you see. It is a two-man vessel. It is made by the Apoa Company. No information on them. There's no logo for them either. It has no cargo capacity whatsoever. It has four upgrade slots, 18 maneuvering thrusters, which seems like a lot because it's to make up for the fact that it has no main engine. The ship runs completely on maneuvering thrusters, making it an unbelievably hard target to hit in the hands of a capable pilot. To be Basically, you have 18 maneuvering thrusters, so basically you'll be going in all directions and kind of the idea of flying like a plane in space that can do maneuvers on the turn of a dime won't apply to this vessel. So this thing can go left, right, up and down at an angle, 90 degree, 45 degree. You can turn it upside down. You can literally turn the thing around like a stick. This thing is extremely maneuverable. And in the hands of a capable pilot, it is literally possible to hit. However, you have to really get good at this thing because I can only guess that trying to fly this thing will be a nightmare considering you have got to have a really, really good idea of where you are in three-dimensional space to be able to pull off successful maneuvers in a firefight with this amount of maneuverability, it is nuts. It will possibly, probably also be, in my personal opinion, very, very sensitive to controls. Also, you have to think about, I wonder, for those of you who are using flight sticks, how this vessel will respond to a flight stick that only has those limited movements and acts like a plane where this thing can literally move in whatever direction. It'll be interesting to see people adapt to this thing. It has two class one guns, guns that only face forward, and it has two class two guns, guns that are on a pivot. Um, all this data is subject to change, and where the gun placements are, I don't exactly know. The next up is the Banu. The humanity and the Banu uh, met on very odd terms. There was a freelance explorer during the early days of exploration who came through a jump point into unexplored sp uh, space and f found another vessel on his radar and immediately opened fire because in space it's pretty much safer to assume they're hostile. And upon firing on the vessel, saw that it wasn't human. It was a very alien vessel. And it turns out it was an alien vessel. And he immediately called the UEE, which immediately brought in scientists and linguists to try and talk to this alien and explain that it was a mess up because they didn't know if... Maybe his buddies would come looking for him, or if he was a soldier and you fired on a soldier and this was an act of war, or maybe he was able to send a message out asking for help. The UE had no idea when this alien's buddies, however big of an empire or a or military force they had, would just come knocking at their door, guns blazing because we fired on their people. But before that ever happened, we did manage to talk to him. They called him Jerry, not to him. They called it that behind his back. And we were able to talk to him and get in contact with his people and explain the situation and avoided the cataclysmic event of a war with an alien race that we know nothing about. Here's a fun fact for all of you. The Banu that was met that day was actually running from authorities for money laundering. 
The Banu are a race of traders. They are very much, think of the Ferengi from Star Trek, and you've got a decent idea of what these guys are. The almighty dollar is everything. Each planet in the Banu Protector, which is what the entire empire is called, has its own government. They all do their own thing. Maybe some are democracies, maybe some are governments, maybe some are completely corporation run. Each planet sends a representative back to the assumed homeworld. We say assumed because we don't actually know where or what the homeworld is called. It's deep in Banu space and protected. The UEE calls it Bacchus, which is the Banu word for place of gatherings. And there they discuss legal and trade issues that affect all of a Banu as a species, so economy issues. It's kind of similar to the idea of the Supreme Court in the United States, for those of you who don't know. Uh, all courts in the United States of America, all their each town has a court, each uh, each state-run government has their courts, and laws differ from state to state. But if the Supreme Court, which is over all courts, makes a ruling, all laws must change. The federal law takes precedent over all lower laws. Um, the militia makes up the bulk of the standing army of the Banu. In fact, they don't even have a standing army. Militias on each world make up the security force, volunteers uh, from the planet side, even if you have um, a prisoner, shut up phone, or if you are someone with a, a bad rap sheet, you can volunteer and you just replace the guys who are upstairs and they kind of pull their money for some security vessels. But that's pretty much it. Um... The entire, all the militias can come together as a, a unified fighting force. However, how that is, who's the generals are, who the colonels are, who gets together, who's, who's the supply line, who are fighter pilots, all that. Uh, we don't know how that works, but the fact that all these militias can bulk up and come together, they are a force to be reckoned with. However, on their own, crime is rampant in Banu space, mostly because all the black market pirates and smugglers and all these shady characters that maybe the Xi'an and the UEE keep on a tight leash, they bring in money. Money is everything to the Banu. Black market, white market, gray market, The all they see is opportunity. They don't see cold-blooded killers or pirates, they see opportunity to make money. There's a lot of crime in Banu space. It is very lawless if you, as long as you pay the right people. Back alleys in Banu space can lead to weird adventures or being stabbed in the back for a few dollars. It is nuts. If you are a fugitive of the UEE, it is very popular to hide in Banu space. Most of the time, the Banu will ignore your presence because you're bringing in you're bringing in money of some sort, goods taken that can be sold on the Banu market. And the Banu refuse to extradite criminals to any other government. Um, it is also note that if you have a very, very big price on your head, it is well known that the UEE sends in sleeper agents to make accidents happen in Banu space. It is very common. But again, on Banu space, the almighty dollar, the almighty dollar is everything. Make sure to bring enough with you, and make sure to always have a gun in your pocket. There are really only three systems. There are two official systems and one planet that I'm going to talk about. There is the Gideon system. The Geddon system, I'm sorry, which only has one planet. It's volcanic, which Banu love. However, humans, not so much. You have to wear a pressure suit on this planet, otherwise you could suffocate and die or die from heat exposure. The weather on this planet is horrific. It is horrible. Now, it is very common to have docking accidents when trying to fly. It is very common to crash or damage your ship when flying in. Now, CIG has said that on launch, Star Citizen will not have in atmospheric flight. So, the idea is that more than likely when you get really close, you'll ask for docking permission and it'll be a cutscene. So, I'm guessing that your ship won't be damaged in a cutscene that you have no control over. However, when atmospheric flight is added in at some point, if it's added in, we don't know if it will. They want it really bad, but, you know, things happen. If and when they add it in, uh, it could be very, very easy for you to damage your nice ship full of goods to bring to this planet because the weather here is horrible. Low visibility, high winds, all that good stuff. You have to be very careful. The one, the one unique addition to this planet is that in the polar region, there is this thing called bad ice. The volcanic gases seep up through the polar ice caps where the water, with the water, it combines to make a poisonous water mixture and it's frozen into ice. If you drill this ice, it is very poisonous and very legal. I'm guessing that you could quite literally make this into ice cubes, drop in someone's drink, and you could poison someone. It would be that easy. It is very legal, but if you're a smuggler with a stealthy ship, 
Um, I'm guessing that this might be a nice source of income for you. Also, I'm wondering that if players will have access to this, because the idea of a player just walking around with poison ice cubes, just dipping it in drinks in a canteen or whatever, and players just all over dropping dead, might be a little bit of a risky issue to put in, although it would be cool as hell to do. That'd be amazing. There is... The Trice system. Again, only a single planet, but it is a Banu holy world. This thing called the Council resides there, and they make policies that affect Banu society on like a social level, whereas the uh, Council on Bacchus refers to them on like an economic level. The Council is located deep in Banu space, away from colonized worlds. The, the Council believes that they need to be away from their people. They need to be separated from them and not have anything to do with them. And I'm guessing that the reason they think this is so that they won't get bogged down in everyday issues and can kind of keep that high on the mountain, um, taught, learned person kind of mentality to make their decisions so that it's not muddied by everyday events. Now, because of this, the council doesn't partake in lots of Banu traditions and they don't even partake in Banu foodstuffs. However, for those of you pilots who were willing to go into way deep into Banu territory, the council does pay high dollar for Xeon and UEE goods because it may, may, means they can have cool, they can have really good food, they can have really good drink, and they have really cool like furniture and luxury items, but they not breaking their oath to their home world, their uh, own people that they are not getting involved with. So if they'll pay top dollar for luxury goods, maybe I'm guessing food and drink, especially drink will be the highest of um, what is in demand in this system. If you trade, or they'll trade you if you bring in something really good, precious art copper pieces that only they make. Um, they are pretty much revered in certain art circles as being very collectible, so you may be able to sell this on the black market as a luxury good, or if you want, personally, I would just keep it in my hangar as a nice little art piece in the center next to my wingman posters. It would be very, very cool. It's also cool to see what this art will look like. Will they be statues? Will they be... Like, my idea... I'm guessing that these will be statues or structures. My idea was that it was a painting, like a flat painting, and that they would... Like, this was my idea. I'm probably completely wrong, but somehow they used liquid molten copper, and they would tint it different hues, and they would use the fact that copper aged, use patinas to make different hues. They'd make paintings that were metal, but they would use molten copper to do it. Now, I didn't even think about, when I was thinking about this, I didn't even think about the fact that they're probably just statues or busts or whatever, but I like my idea way more. So if anyone from CIG is watching, get on that, because that sounds like a really good idea. And there are lots of systems that they talked about that are really close to Banu space, but the only other one uh, is Bacchus, which is the home world, which we really don't know anything about. Uh, the Banu Merchantman, very popular vessel, uh, subject to a bit of debate on which end was the front end. Um, it is a merchant clipper. It is made by Burke, which is an all cap, so it's possibly an acronym, although whether the Banu even use acronyms is up for grabs. 60 ton cargo capacity, crew of four, six upgrade slots, Two class one turrets, five class two turrets, uh, two guns that face forward, five guns on a swivel, and two class five turrets, which is five, uh, two anti-aircraft manned cannons similar to the ones on the Retaliator. All this again is subject to change. Banu merchant vessels, above all other vessels, are prized because they're sturdy, they are well bit, and they are passed from generation to generation, which means a couple of them may be hundreds of years old. This gives the, the, the impression of impeccable craftsmanship, impeccable quality, and the fact that they can last a long time, so they can probably have some good defense capabilities. Um, the, the way the Banu operate also suggests this isn't confirmed, this was kind of a forum thing that was bouncing around, that on the front of the Banu craft, it looks like there's a dock there. And it looks like smaller vessels can dock with the Banu Merchantman, which would be really awesome because then that means that similar to the Starfarer, which can function as a mobile fuel refinery, the Banu Merchantman can work as a mobile market where you can sell the goods. You don't have to go to a station or to an asteroid base. You could actually make a mobile market in space where people could buy, sell, and trade on your ship, which would be really cool because the inside of it, like the way you could probably decorate it, you could probably make your own little stalls or you could like customize it so if you wanted to sell luxury goods you could just spread them out like a warehouse or if you wanted to sell guns just have guns everywhere it would be a really cool idea although whether it's confirmed or not i don't know 
There's also another argument that always seems to boil up on the forums, is that the comparison between the Starfarer and the Merchantman if you are an economy pilot. Now here is my personal take on it. The, the argument always seems to boil down to the Banu Merchantman holds less cargo but trades it for far more defense capabilities than the Starfarer, meaning that you can take the Banu Merchantman into more dangerous space and work alone, whereas the Starfarer will probably need an escort. The way I see it is that the Starfarer is a liquid hauler, it is a tanker that can be a mobile refinery. The Banu Merchantman is a mobile market and more of a dry goods things in crate hauler. They both they are both big space trucks, but they both fulfill very unique roles. The, the Starfarer will carry liquid cargo and fuel for ships to be sold on the market or for, or for, um, or for big groups of ships that are moving out so that they don't have to keep going back to base. The Banu Merchantman is to hold things like missiles and stuff and whatnot. And they, the vessels are both space trucks, but they both have entirely different purposes. So it really depends on what you as an economy pilot want to do. You want a marketable dry goods ship or do you want to haul fuel around, which is a necessity, which, you know you may not need but also the ability to make your own fuel so you will be essential in long-range convoys that's my take on it take it as the way you will i know that if the banu merchantman ever goes on sale again i will probably be picking it up and i may melt a few of my vessels even though it doesn't have lti i really don't care about that the last alien race, and by far the most vicious, are the Vondul. In 2681, the colony of Armitage in the Orion system, the furthest away from human space, the, the furthest human colony ever, was sat. They went and found the colony had been bombed from the air, and any of the 638 colony members that didn't, didn't die from the airborne barrages were killed as teams of aliens swept from house to house, murdering men, women, and children alike with no mercy. Everything was looted and robbed, although the aliens, which we found out were called Vandal from the Bono Protectorate after we saw grainy video footage because initially we thought it was just human pirates that had attacked. Uh, many things were looted and destroyed, but it's weird because some valuable artifacts like jewelry were left behind and some useless junk was taken, given the idea that they were looted by aliens who had no idea of what humans considered valuable. The Vandal are very large aliens. They're over 8 feet tall, they're very intimidating looking, and they are tribal creatures. They work in war bands, and the Vandals spend almost all of their life in space. From a very early age, they take to space, and the Vandal have adapted to many... Their bodies have adapted to um, survive on many different types of atmospheres and many different types of climates. Because Vandu literally spend their life, male Vandu specifically, no female Vandu have ever been found in a, uh, a military vessel, but it's very hard to keep, catch them alive or even catch them in one piece to make that dissertation. Um, they spend a lot of their time in space. They go around like pirates. Any any planet that a Vandu lands on, lands on, whether it's barren, whether it's full of people, it's theirs. They take it, they kill everybody, they take all their stuff, and that planet is theirs forever. Even if they leave and don't come back for a thousand years, if they come back and they find someone on that planet and they haven't built anything, that, that's their planet. It's theirs. Leave it. I mean, that's theirs. We'll kill everybody, we'll take everything again. It's ours. We own it. They're very brutal people, a very warlike people. They take everything they have, although they do have custom vessels. So this does... The Vandal don't use... Like, their navies aren't made up of a bunch of vessels that have been taken. The Vandal have vessels. In fact, they even have a, car a carrier. In one UEE security post, the X-12 was a massive Vandal carrier that had over 300 of these Scythe fighters in it. And there's no artwork available. And the story was that a reactor accident had killed everyone in the inner of the ship. It was highly armored. It was so armored that the explosion just was inward and melted all the decks. There were 300 fighters in, only 150 of them, or I'm sorry, only 100 of them were available to be launched. The other ones were just spare parts or, you know, destroyed. And in the deck only had enough, uh, only 33 of them were ready to go at any time. But that's still the fact that these guys have big carriers, they have their own fighters. The Vandal have worlds somewhere with factories somewhere that are pumping out custom vessels. And a cool little thing that I like to notice about the uh, the Vandal is that um, when you look at their ship, the Scythe, it looks very brutal. It looks 
it looks very, very dangerous, and it looks rusty, and it looks like a killer vessel, but if you look on the inside, the inside concept art, it's very lovely, it's very beautiful, it's not just a bunch of wires and crap everywhere, there seems to be, there seems to be patterns, there seems to be, like, colors involved, softer hues, um, somewhere in Vandal's space, there is someone who makes the inside of a spaceship very well. He is a, there is a Vandal who prides himself on craftsmanship and not war, and so, and it also means that there are Vandal who pride his craftsmanship, which it kind of brings back stories of, like, Genghis Khan, when, um, was it Genghis Khan who, yeah, Genghis Khan, not Attila the Hunt, because Genghis Khan attacked Rome. Uh, Genghis Khan would attack Rome, I'm, I'm sorry, I may be getting him confused with Attila, but Genghis Khan would attack Rome, and everyone thought that his barbarians were brutal, and they raped, and they were dirty, and they mated with pigs, and they slept in the mud, but they found, uh, scrolls and documents really later on, um, that talked about people who had went to see Genghis, and when they went and saw him, he was living in a large home, he had a very organized village, his village was very peaceful and clean, the people weren't running around raping each other, and children were running around clothed, he had a library, and he read, he was educated, his children were educated and taught, he had Roman baths, heated, that were in his room, he was this figure that used brutality and rage and fear and but really when he got back home he had style he had education it was just a tool for him for him to continue his lifestyle and that's what i kind of see with the vandal a group of people that everyone puts off as these murderous aliens who have no education that are and are really thin-brained but um, it looks like that there's more to the vandal than lets on that maybe somewhere deep down back in their society there are some organized or some culturally um there's culture there's there's something there Although, getting there will be very hard because they murder everything that isn't them. They own, they really only own one system, and that is the uh, system is the Tiber system. Um, when I say control, the warbands always move, so the fact that they have one system they stay in is kind of rare. The reason they stay in the Tiber system is because it's a really easy place for warbands to group up and get out into UEE space and raid. It's called the Grinder by the military because multiple times the UEE has sent in bombers and they've sent in small craft to assassinate bigger craft and sabotage and they've sent in full fleet actions, but every time the, the Vandal have pushed them back, which means that the area is not only a staging area for Vandal, but it is a very, very large graveyard of military and Vandal vessels. So if you're a salvager and you want to try to get your hands on some military goods that are probably broken and need some work, or maybe you'll look and you'll come across something, or maybe some Vandal stuff, you can go here and loot it, but there are Vandal everywhere. It is a very Vandal populated area. So I would suggest stealth over numbers and guns, because the minute that you roll in with a large armed convoy, that the whole point of the convoy is to shoot up everything and keep them away, the Vandal will love you because they love that. They love big convoys of people that they can mess up and who fight back. Go in quiet is my recommendation. The only other system that the Vandu will have a large impact on from what I've seen is the Orion system, which was the furthest um, colonization effort from Earth, and the Vandu raided it, and they continued to raid it for six months, and because of the fact that it was so far away, supply caravans couldn't get there, the military couldn't get there an entire time, and the military that got there couldn't be resupplied enough, so eventually humanity had to just file out of the system and abandon it, which means that there's a lot of abandoned buildings, abandoned structures, there actually are humans still on the planet, it's descendants of the original uh, settlements, or settlers that survived, live in caves deep below the ground, you can land on the planet, although besides exploring old ruins and trying to find a trinket or two, there's nothing there. There. Um, there are no luxury good market. There's no market at all. You won't find anything for sale, but you can probably trade things. Maybe old equipment that they don't know what to do with anymore. You can probably trade it for food or water. The big thing about the system, and the only reason you would want to go there, is because there is a string of asteroids that still have a lot of gold and platinum in them. Uh, this is a very big haul. This is the idea of you taking a mining ship and a couple of cargo vessels and going out and literally coming back to mark to regular space with ships laden in gold and platinum. It is every merchantman and smuggler's dream. The problem is 
the logistics. The colony is very far out. You have to go into Vandal occupied space. The Vandal aren't there as much as they used to be, but patrols still come in. So you have to go out into far out space. You have to go through unsecured systems full of pirates, marauders, Vandal, and other aliens, plus other players, and mine the stuff and keep the mining equipment safe and the cargo vessels safe and then get back through all of these uh, enemy controlled systems full of these unsavory characters full with your cargo holds literally bursting at the seams meaning your ships are slower the logistics of this are nuts the idea the amount the amount of cargo vessels you would need just to justify the trip the mining equipment that you would have to need the mining ships you would need the escorts that you would need to keep yourself safe because I know if you roll together in a couple of freelancers, you're still going to want maybe an Avenger, a couple of uh, 325As, a couple of F7Cs. You're going to need some escorts and you're going to need some big cargo ships and you're probably going to need a Starfarer or maybe a Starfarer fully loaded with fuel to keep you guys fueled and maybe another cargo vessel full of reloaded guns and, or, for, or ammo for guns that require ammo and missiles for the ones that you're going to use. So you have to buy all this stuff, put it in the big cargo vessels, figure out how much you need versus how much cargo you want to bring back, go through all these systems with the Starfarer to refuel you and... Hopefully you've got enough gas, get all the way there, come back with your cargo holds full. It, it's going to be a logistical nightmare, but if you guys can pull it off, you would literally have a starship full of gold and platinum. You'd be rich. It, it's a, it, this is probably the most risk versus reward I've ever seen, and the rewards are just through the roof. So if you guys are in a corporate mercantile kind of thing... I mean, I would want to try this, no doubt. I would totally hop into my Starfarer and volunteer, as long as it's a well-organized crew. I would totally volunteer to load my Starfarer up with thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of fuel and just trug out there and go get this stuff for a cut. I would totally do it. But enough of that, we're going to get to the Von Duel Scythe itself. The Scythe has never been available for, for sale. However, CIG has talked about, like, if you came to their studio for some special events, they kind of gave away a few. So it's kind of thinking that maybe someone out there has a Vandal Scythe. It is only a crew of one S4 upgrade slots, two Class 1 guns, guns that only face forward, four Class 3 guns, which means you can hold four missiles on it, and one Class 4 accessory, a ramming blade. It is very fast, it is very maneuverable, it only it has 12 maneuvering thrusters and a main engine, which means it's... It's basically a fighter that has only four thrust maneuvering thrusters less than the uh, Xeon Scout, which only runs on maneuvering thrusters. So this thing is very maneuverable, can get around, and it's very, very armed to the teeth. No room for cargo. They'll have, which means that probably there are Vandal cargo vessels similar to maybe the Drake Cutlass that come in and scrounge up cargo and goodies. And, uh, or maybe larger transport vessels, which if you get your hands on those, I bet those things are well armored and, uh, are well suited to long haul trips, seeing as how they, they don't, they never land. They spend all their time in space. And which to think about it, if you were to get your hands on a Vondel transport vessel, if there is one, it's probably well suited to linking up to vessels in space because it doesn't dock anywhere. It just links up to larger vessels where it distributes its goods. So that might be an interesting vessel to get your hands on. But it's a very, very brutal vessel. It's very, they're, they're very brazen. And the fact of the matter means it, it doesn't have a lot of shield. It has very low shield. But the fact that there's literally a ramming blade on the thing for you to run into people means that if you're flying this thing, you are going to be a very, very aggressive pilot. Otherwise, you're just going to get shot up because it doesn't have a lot of a very big shield on it. Well, that is all today. That is everything that I've done research on about the aliens. I may have missed a few things. Maybe I've enlightened a few of you. Maybe I've just made a complete fool of myself. Whatever. I do this for fun because I love Star Citizen. I love this game and I love where it's going. And I don't take anything I said here as far as like going and getting bad ice and going and getting, um, you know, gold and silver. Some of this stuff may, may not be in the game when it comes out. Some of it may be added later. So keep in mind that all the ship stats can change and all of these different little things that you might be able to do on the planets can change or they may be added in later or won't be out on release. So take everything I've said with a grain of salt. This has been Shows with the AirHots Game Community. I'm so glad you guys tuned in. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you all another time.